Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, my name is Greg Gibson. I'm a wedding portrait and event photographer in the Washington, D.C. area. This is the uh, second in kind of what I'm calling the Weathering the Storm series to try to help photographers uh, with some useful information and also uh, some interesting things about what all of us are doing in this, uh, in this time of crisis. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking to a good friend of mine, uh, photographer Paul Giroux, uh, who was up in uh, the Wisconsin area. The first episode we did, we just did, uh, was last Friday night, and uh, that, was a, that was a live stream on contracts and legalities. We had um, author John Harrington on, who wrote the book, Best Business Practices for Photographers, and we had the um, lawyer and legal counsel for the National Press Photographers Association, Mickey Osterreicher, on with us, and they gave us some great information about how to deal with our contracts and legalities with regard to cancellations and refunds and all these issues that we are running into right now uh, in this unprecedented situation. Um, I did want to, um, one thing that Mickey brought up that I thought was a really good point was now in a time of crisis <clears throat> is there's no time like the present to join an organization. Uh, when you join an organization, you become a voice of many and that's how you get your voice amplified and that's how you get some results. And I think that the National Press Photographers Association has been really uh, active in trying to get the word out um, to photographers about um, how to protect themselves and what's going on in the environment. So um, also the American Society of Media Photographers, ASMP.org, they have put up um, some information as well. And um, the Professional Photographers of America, they have a site as, up as well. Uh, one thing about the PPA site, um, you'll need to use this link because I don't believe that this link is active on the main page. But um, NPPA is actually going to have a town hall meeting tomorrow night, a live stream town hall meeting similar to what we're doing tonight um, at 8 o'clock. They're going to have their... Um, their director, their, their safety officer uh, is going to be on uh, with, with Mickey uh, Osterreicher as well to talk about some legalities, but also to talk about how you can protect yourself um, if you're out having to, um, having to actually work or be around other people. It is a really uh, interesting time. I had to run some errands this afternoon, and just being in a grocery store or out in public is just uh, an unusual time. People really are uh, afraid of one another, and um, it, it's an interesting, interesting time to be to be. It's an interesting time in our lives. But um, Paul Giroux, who we're going to have on tonight, he and I, he was helping me work on this live stream last week, and sort of at the end, it was about midnight uh, Thursday or Friday, and Paul and I were talking, and Paul was telling me that he had this idea that sort of came about because he's. His sister uh, was just afraid to bring her family over to his house uh, just due to the whole social distancing thing. And so he had to run over to her house the next day for something, and he just remembered pulling out of the driveway and seeing them all standing in the doorway. And uh, that had an impact on him. And so Paul is a, a longtime photojournalist, and at being that visual storyteller, that image stuck in his mind. It really resonated with him. And so he came up with this idea of, going around to his neighbors and just doing pictures of how they were living their lives just from their porch or from their doors or their windows. So I think Paul can describe it much better than I can, so I'm going to bring Paul on right now. Um, just let me say one other thing, too. I have uh, my good friend Matt Mendelson uh, is with us, and Matt's my good buddy. He's my wingman, and he's going to help uh, moderate and, and ask questions. I do find it a little bit difficult trying to manage the whole uh, show here to be able to stay in touch with what's being discussed. So I have Matt here to back me up. So Paul, why don't we um, jump over to you and why don't you just tell us a little bit about how this whole thing came about and, and what kind of reaction you've gotten from it. Hey guys, uh, thanks Greg and Matt. Thank you guys for having me here. This project has taken on a life of its own. And in the 35 years that I've been a photographer, I've never seen something that I've done have such a critical mass and it started like greg said with uh, recognizing the separation from family and i was trying to put these elements together and like many photographers my event business my social events that i cover has just cratered 
So what can I as a photographer do in, in, the, in the face of this chaos? And this is what I came up with. And it's been a project that's kind of fed my soul, but more so than that, it's been something that's brought comfort to my neighbors and my friends, and they tell me how much it means to them to have this because I think people realize that we are in uncharted waters. Hang on, I think we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulty. Oh, okay. What's the issue? Go ahead, go ahead, Paul. I think we lost Matt. Oh no. Okay. Um, it's just such a time that we've never seen. I've never seen it in my during my career, nor my lifetime. And I think people want to connect with that, and they want to connect with their friends, and they want to share with their family what they're going through, and they want to remember it, and they want it, their kids to remember it if they're small, so that in 20, 30 years, maybe when their kids have grandkids, or when they, they are grandparents themselves, they'll have photos to remind them of what times were like now. So it's been the most life-changing event that I've ever taken part of and who would think that it's made with from from the sidewalk of people at their home on their porch in their windows it's beyond me I can't believe it but it's that's what's happening uh, as I understand you've been getting uh, quite a bit of media attention I I saw it looked like um, the local newspaper had come out and had done uh, an article on you yep. here and it looked like also maybe you had gotten some TV exposure yeah. as well. Yeah, the Channel 3 is our Madison affiliate, and they came out and did a story yesterday. Just um, And it received a lot of shares on Facebook. A lot of people were talking about it. and uh, it, it It's just amazing to me how much this little project has grown and how happy people are to do this and how in, and how inspiring it is to me to just be able to make these photos it's 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 amazing to me i just <laughs> i know i keep shaking my head but i mean we we've booked a hundred sessions in you know to, to photograph over eight days and that's just i mean that's a that's a year for me well a hundred sessions Let, now how much are you charging for this nothing this yeah. is totally pro bono and i mean that has obviously is fueling some of the, the urgency, but I think even more than that, I think what it want people want to connect and they want to they want to show what they're going through and they want to remember it. This is historic for them, and it's pretty historic for me too. Uh, I have two kids, fourteen and ten, and so we're dealing with you know keeping them occupied, keeping them happy, and dealing with them trying to want to see their friends but not being able to. So it's just been quite a experience for all of us well let's let's jump into some of the images and let okay. you talk about those a bit the image that you're showing is actually they're my grand nieces hey, believe it or not yes Matt Matt Can you, you have a question now? Matt do you have a question I don't know if Matt's coming in and out. Anyway, go go ahead. Yeah, I'm, these are actually my. I'm here. Everything coming through okay, Matt? Yeah, the sound is a little uh, wobbly here. I'm not sure if it's on my end or globally. So oh. go, keep going. Oh, okay. Okay. You're doing. Uh, these Paul, are. Paul is, yeah, I, I'm Paul. hearing Paul, and Paul's hearing me. So I think it must be uh, on your end, bud. Okay. These are actually my, <clears throat> excuse me, my grand nieces. So my sister's grandchildren. My sister lives about a half mile from us, if that, and my niece lives about three miles from us. And we'd see them three or four times a week. But because of this, they've all social distanced from even us, family. And I went to the house last week to pick something up from my nephew-in-law, and I saw the girls 
this wasn't the photo I saw, but in my mind, that photo stuck in my mind and I wanted to come back. And so I came back about an hour later to photograph them. And that's how this project started. And just sharing that because I just felt like the photo of the girls reminded me in a, in a way of an old movie with John Travolta called The Boy in the Bubble. And so I was putting the elements of The Boy in the Bubble with the, the novel Love in the Time of Cholera and then the great painting by Grant Woods from Iowa of American Gothic of people in front of their homes. And all of those kind of came together and that's how I came up with this project to do. And it just felt like the right thing to do. And, you know, we're all former photojournalists. So those old photojournalist instincts kick in and, you know, you want to be able to tell a story that of something that's world changing like this is and then personalize it on a local basis. And that's what we've done. Absolutely. Let's. Um... Hey, Paul, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah. Matt, so right. you know, you talk about the, you talk about the American Gothic, and it's funny because this comes on the heels. Your project comes on the heels of a project that was widely shared on Facebook probably three weeks ago, which was a New Yorker, a photographer uh, published in the New Yorker, who long ago decided that um, she was going to photograph her parents waving goodbye as she left the driveway saw of that. their house year after year after year the most simple story idea you can think of. And, and of course the parents got older and older. It was beautiful and this really reminds oh. me, it's, a, it's really in that same vein of just sort of this timeless moment being captured. Uh, I, I, love, I love the little stuffed gremlin. It's, oh. all, it's just all perfect <laughs> right there. Hey, that's frizzy, man, get it right. <laughs> <laughs> So Paul, let's let's just back up for a second, and maybe you went over this a little bit before, but um, so what is the actual process for doing the shoot? So I know that you are following the CDC recommended guidelines for social distancing. Yeah. So what what is the actual process when you arrive at somebody's house, and how how do you, how do you conduct these? Well, we set up a time through a scheduling software, a scheduling app, through my website, and people then get a reminder of when I will stop by. And then they're waiting for me. They're out on the front porch and I'm on the sidewalk. We say hello and wave from a distance and talk. And then I start seeing what I have there and photographing them either on the porch or seated on a chair there on the porch or on the edge of their porch or maybe through the window or all four. It varies. Everything's a little bit different. It's all simple. It's shot with a very simple 70 to 200 to 8 and maybe a 135 occasionally and one camera. And it's about as simple as it gets. There's no lighting, no artif artificial lighting at all. It's just available light. So whatever l the light that's there, whatever angle the house faces, that's the way it goes. Sometimes if they're very strongly front lit or side lit, I might put them into the backlight and do a, a, a family photo that way, the 70 to 200 long at about F4 and just go from there. But it's, they're really simple. They're about five to 10 minutes long. And I try to photograph the family with animals, the, the parents, and I like to photograph the kids as a sibling group. And then individually I photograph the kids and then I move on to the next. So I put them on the half hour and just go from there. So, um, so when you get there, I mean, I, I'm assuming you're just sort of like shouting back and forth at one another. So yeah. Do you have any issues communicating with people, especially people who may not want no. to come outside? No, and nobody's, nobody's ever felt that they didn't want to come outside, at least so far. And uh, everybody feels pretty comfortable, even as we're in kind of chilly spring here in Wisconsin. But you know, like today it was 47 in the afternoon. So we had a little heat wave and people are very comfortable and they really respect the social distancing and nobody's that I photographed has had any of the symptoms or any way uh, showing any signs of any, even colds or flus. So it's been good that way. I, I would think that they would tell me 
if that was the case, I would trust that they would. But so far, everybody's been very healthy and happy and very eager to do this, which is really so reassuring to me because I feel like this is really important and I'm so glad to be able to do it for people. I think it's going to be quite a historic piece for them. And so I know you said you uh, you had booked a uh, hundred sessions, which you was going to be your max. So how yeah. you do you want to talk a little bit about the process that you're using for doing the bookings? Yeah, I have a Squarespace website. So that one that you're showing on the bot on the screen is Squarespace, and Squarespace has a scheduling software called Squarespace Scheduling that they bought from Acuity. I don't know when, but it is built in as a widget into Squarespace, and it's pretty darn easy to set up and I photographed my sister and her husband and their dog today and um, she said it was as easy as she could find you know of anything to to, um, to schedule so she found it very easy to use and very intuitive and the only time we've had trouble is if people have signed up for a uh, have done their questionnaire but then forgot to or, or didn't know to go to the scheduling app and sometimes people schedule and then forget to fill out the questionnaires. And the reason that that's important is because the questionnaire tells me the street address. And then I also ask a few questions that I want to put into a possible book. If that's what's the next step that answers some questions that they, you know, have that they want to leave behind for posterity, which I think is really cool too. So it's going to be like a visual and a, and a story, a text bit of a time capsule from, March of 2020. So, uh, so just to reiterate, so all the all the bookings are done online via the web. You show up at someone's house. You pull up in the driveway or out on the street. I believe I I wish I had the little picture. I saw a picture of you on Facebook somewhere. I think where you were using a ladder, and so yeah. um, so you're shooting basically from a ladder from out in the street or in the driveway. So you're a good. 20 to 50 feet or more away, I guess, yep. I assume, keeping that distance. Yep. 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 And then what, sometimes what is a your... bit closer, but it's, sometimes a bit closer, but it's within the CDC guidelines. It's usually about 12 feet away or and more. So uh, it, you touched on it just briefly. What do you, what do you sort of see as your long-term, uh, what, what is your long-term end for this project? Well, for one, the, the folks that I photograph will receive the photos. So that's, it's something that's a pro bono. So that's my gift to them for, for being a part of it. They agree to sign a model release for me, which allows me to showcase the photos. And I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it, but I, I feel like a book is, in, is in the, in the works for it. And then, uh, someone from a, a college friend who, is connected with an art gallery in, in Wisconsin near Milwaukee, reached out to me to see if I would be interested in exhibiting at that gallery, which blew my mind. That would be so cool. I mean, I just, it, this is a little tiny town and a little tiny project, but it's taken on a lot of, uh, it's just kind of grown like a ripple. And it's so neat to, to hear from people that I haven't heard from in a while that are interested in doing this or meeting people like I've heard from people in Norway and Germany and all over about this project thanks to social media and it really is like it's so nice that they reach out because they ask would it be okay if I do this and I'm like of course you know this is this is not my only I mean this is not my idea other people have thought about this too it doesn't happen in a vacuum but I'm happy that they're in, intrigued enough or that they're excited enough to want to do that that they think it's important enough for them to do and I really think it is that's in that connection through uh I think, photos of us I, I think that's where that's you hit the nail on the head right there because i think you're you're talking locally in terms of wisconsin and i keep thinking of this project as a global you know network of photographers who could create this kind of body of work that you know a hundred years from now will be in the ken burns documentaries of their time um it's it's the fact that it's pro bono, that it's not, you're not doing this as a business endeavor, you're doing this really for posterity. You're giving these prints to these people. But again, I see this as a, I see this as a Library of Congress project. And I think you need to set your sights a little higher. I think this has, 
Um, uh, there's just something about these pictures that you can see being included years, decades, decades down the line. Um, I think you need to uh, you need to think more globally. <laughs> Paul Giro World Enterprises here. Um, because this well, is an idea it, it, that you can share with us. it's your it's your idea. Let's let's do, do that. But you can give mm -hmm. this, you know, like you're giving the story code to photographers essentially around the world and saying document your own town. And then at the end of the day, next year, the world has this body. It's different from pictures, by the way, that you see wire service photographers shooting on a daily basis. You know, um, the police barricading off the cherry blossoms. That's a different kind of of a of, of photo essay. This is really just portraiture. And um, I think you can, you can go much further. Hmm. I, I think that's a really good point. And I, I want to follow up on that because, I mean, this is truly an unprecedented historic time in the history of the world. We have never, well, in modern times anyway, we've never faced anything like this. And I, I sit here and wonder sometimes who it is that's going to come out and who's going to be the storyteller and who's going to be the, uh, the Dorothea Lang of this time. And uh, it really is, there really is opportunity there for to have that impact on the history of photography and the history of journalism and the history of storytelling. And so I'm really curious who is going to be that person that's going to step up and lead that charge. Now, I will say I've seen a little bit of criticism uh, about, and Paul's not the only person that's doing this project. Now, Paul is the first person I know um, that did this. And in the aftermath, I have seen other people talking about um, doing similar things. I know there's a photographer in, um, in Rhode Island named Josh Behan who's doing something he calls porch, porch traits, which is getting people out on their, on their front porches and, um, and doing something similar to what Paul's doing. But he's had nowhere near sort of the volume of work that Paul's gotten out of. And Paul, Paul has by far the most amount of work of anybody that I've ever heard. But I have seen some, some criticism in the, in the photographic community from some other photographers just about um, should you, because you're out and about taking pictures, are you, giving, are you setting the wrong example? So or because you're out doing this thing, does that uh, give other people calls to, to go out and, and mingle and get together and maybe not follow the CDC guidelines. And so there's that whole train of thought. Are, are we, should we really just hunker down and shelter ourselves and nobody get out of the house? But I honestly think that from a historical perspective that this, t this time in history, this point in history needs to be documented. And so we need to be able to do it uh, in some way that is, is safe and regimented um, and, 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 provides that historical perspective that's going to be needed years from now. I agree. And one of the things that's going on here in Wisconsin is that the governor has put an order similar to what's going on in Illinois, right. kind of a shelter in place order starting at eight in the morning. And, you know, one of the things that you're allowed to do is walk and ride, and go to the store. And if you're going to give, comfort to a friend. I mean, that is something that fits within the legal, um, the legal, I guess, parameters of this thing. It, it's, it's, it's a very broad and a, a very tough thing to say. And I haven't really decided what to do now, but, um, I'd love to continue this project and you know, I, I don't want to put anybody in risk and I don't want anybody to think that I take those uh, edicts not seriously. But if people are out and about, I don't really and, and they're maintaining social distance even to go walk the dog. I mean, is it really that much different? I don't think it is. But some people have very, very strong ideas about that. But I think this is really important to do. And it does give comfort to the people that I photograph and they say how much it means to them that, that they're being, a, that they're a part of this. It gives them a little bit of joy and a little relief in their day when they're all kind of locked up, but it also gives them something for their family history, for their family archive. So it's almost this blend of 
almost news and almost media, but not really, not in the classic sense that Greg and Matt and I covered, but in a long form essay that might be similar to FSA and is really important on a personal level to the people. The beauty of this is the folks that I photograph, not only will they be a part of the whatever's created as a result, but they will also own those photographs and they'll be able to print them for their kids and their grandkids and they'll be able to put them on the wall if they want. It's up to them. I think it really is a very important project. I think if people can keep the safety of our client, our subjects, not clients, these are our portrait subjects, at the utmost uh, of concern and we maintain social distancing, I think it, it's, it's a worthy goal, it's a worthy project. Well, I mean, I, I certainly think so. And I mean, I, I don't, I certainly don't want to sit here and imply that photographers are uh, up there with the first responders and medical staff. Certainly, yeah. you know, those people are the true saints and the true heroes in sure. this whole situation. But <clears throat> photographers putting themselves at risk for the greater good of a story is certainly not something that is new from Matthew Brady to Robert Kappa to Chris Hondros and modern times. Photographers have certainly been at risk and often don't get uh, a lot of credit for um, putting their lives on the lines or putting themselves at risk uh, in pursuit of a story that needs to be told. Or Chernobyl. I mean, this really actually is closer to going in and making portraits of people, you know, um, uh, people who have uh, survived Chernobyl. I've seen photo essays um, of, uh, you know, the birth defects that came after Chernobyl. But I, I think this is, I agree with Greg, this is a very worthy project. It's not that people should just go start doing around their neighborhood. It's best left for a photojournalist who, who understands uh, how to do this safely. But I think, uh, I think these are pictures that will definitely be needed. Aside from, again, the daily documentary photos that you see coming out of the wire services, these are more like the, the Dust Bowl pictures or pictures of children uh, uh, working in 1906 in the, in the, in the food uh, districts of Manhattan, those pictures that you do see in Ken Burns documentaries. And you go, how, who was shooting this stuff? Who, were, who had the sense to make these pictures of these little eight-year-old kids making, uh, making food and working in terrible conditions? Well, I think somebody had to do it. And I think that's why this is really striking. And it really has unlimited potential. And let, let's be clear here too. And I want I want I want the audience, you know, this this video is going to live on YouTube, and I want to end on Facebook, and I want to make sure that, you know, everybody that watches this video is clear. Nobody here is trying to make any money. All of us, everybody in the in the photographic industry, we are stressing about our jobs. I don't know if you can see the bags under my eyes, but to be honest with you, I haven't slept a lot for the last couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, I'm stressing about work. I've had, you know, many events cancel. I'm basically unemployed for the foreseeable future. And so we're all stressed about money. But this is, a, this is something that Paul is doing to give back. Paul's doing this pro bono. And, in fact, most people, uh, most other instances of photographers who are involved in a similar project are doing it pro bono. I've even seen uh, some instances where photographers are doing it and they are charging some nominal fee but they're donating that money to charity so i think everybody i don't think anybody that's involved in this at least that i know is trying to use it as a profit center nobody's trying to profit off of this situation um i think they're either using it uh with charitable intent or uh like paul is it's just to promote like some goodwill in his community uh, in a in a time where everybody is really depressed so I think maybe let's, uh, Matt, unless you have something else, or Paul, you have something else to add, let's kind of jump back in no. and I'm going to go through some of the pictures and let Paul talk about some of the pictures. Okay, sure. Okay, so we looked at that one. Let me just. Okay, While Greg's this... doing that, I do have a question for you, Paul. Oh, go ahead. I, I saw on your website, 
you had an important disclaimer, and maybe you can talk about that for a second, which is none of the people that you intend to photograph or have photographed um, are have tested positive. Um, how does that change right. the equation? Would you would would you photograph somebody who came to the door wearing a face mask who had tested positive? I mean, what's what's the distinction? Well, I just want people to know that if those photos get copied and repurposed and somebody says that these people have COVID-19, that it's like, no, that's not the case. If if that person that I did photograph happened to have it, then that would change the way that that would be identified and captioned. But I just want people to know that these are healthy people that are in quarantine and and we are all experiencing or we are all respecting the current CDC guidelines for social distancing so right. that people can realize that no this is serious and we take it serious I take the health of my the subjects that I'm photographing very seriously these are my neighbors you know these right. are my some of them are my friends some of them are people I've never met until this project but these are my they are my neighbors and I want to take care of I want to make sure that they're healthy and that I take care of them through this you know I want it I want to be a good neighbor and I want to have I want them to have to photographs that they're gonna absolutely just be so glad that they had taken okay let's uh, let's jump back in here to uh, some of the pictures that's so beautiful oh, thanks yeah, that let's pull that, up. that little okay. that little frizzy has been hers since she was. Uh, the, the these two are just they're one of the reasons we moved back is because my fourteen year old who was twelve said I want to watch these two girls grow up when we were living in California, and I got that from her, which was basically permission that we could leave, and I'm so glad that we did because to see these little girls and just watch them grow up. I documented my niece since she was this age, only I didn't see her, but maybe once or twice a year. Now we see them quite a bit. Hey, Paul, we have a question from Marcy Nicewander, uh, professor Hi, of journalism at the University of Ohio. Um, we know him. You know, Marcy. Did I get that right? Is it University? Of, it's not University. Ohio, of Ohio. Ohio University. It's Ohio University. I'm sorry, Marcy. I know that. I know that. Ohio University. So Marcy is a photojournalism professor uh, at the at the journalism school there, one of the best photojournalism schools uh, in the world. So Marcy has the question: Does Paul doing this project help his subjects interact with someone new? Paul. Uh, Are, do you feel like people feel like they're part of something bigger? Do you feel oh, like, do, yeah. do the subjects feel like they're part of something bigger? And does it help they you do. in the same way? And help me in the same way. Um, yeah, I, I think they're, they're, I think they love to be a part of a project like this. They, it, it just binds them as a community. And they're, they're just, they've just been so great. And it's, I, I've just had the most amazing experiences, even in these little 15 minute interactions that I have with people. And I just, it's hard to describe it because, you know, as a photojournalist, all we wanted to do was spend time with people, you know, like that would give us these long photo essays where we had all kinds of eight hours, you know, weddings or eight to 10 hours. And then these are literally 10 minutes long, but yet I'm, blown away that I'm able that these people give me so much in such a short period of time. It's it's almost like Paul, it's almost like that great episode of Parks and Rec where the entire town of Pawnee argues over what they should put into the time capsule. Everybody has their own idea of what they need to put into the time capsule. And what what you're doing here is establishing pieces to put into a time capsule and I think everybody wants to be part of that. I think people sense that this is more than just a photo for them to keep, but it's a photo that yeah. will, you know, live as a, a, a time capsule piece. Yeah, I, I feel it is, especially when you put the photos with the words. I mean, some of the things that these people have written are just unbelievably profound and will tell it 
a real additional side of the story about what's going on in, in March of 2020. Right, and that actually, uh, we have another question um, from Vivian who, who notes that a lot of people have been urged to start journals and in the same way, the same vein, um, you know, so that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, the way I look at pictures of my great uncle Joe Mendelssohn in 1916 on his Indian motorcycle, he'd be dead two years later in the Spanish flu. Um, right. I think uh, people are being urged to keep track of this, uh, whether in, via a journal or the way you're doing it, which is more of, again, sort of a photographic time capsule, the way I see it, uh, something that will be viewed 100 years from now. People will say, this is what was happening in 2020. Hey, Paul, Patrick, Murphy, Racy. Hey, Pat Hi, says Pat. that uh, maybe you could bring Windex on as a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Brad, oh, I Brad, get it. I thought I get it now. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, you're from Wisconsin. We get it that you're slow. Yeah. Yeah. So um, another question, Brad I, Noblet asks, uh, how does Paul get people to pose for these shots? I just kind of direct them with hand gestures and I, I tell them clearly, I, you know, the thing is, is I have done so many portraits over the last 15 years and I'm sure Matt and Greg can agree. I mean, I've done a charity book project where I probably photographed 600 kids in the course of nine years when we were in California. So I'm used to photographing and posing people and I tell them exactly how I'd like them to be. But then I also tell them things one of the things that I learned from my friend David Williams, when he said, when you're trying to get pose, to pose people, it's like, it's not moving them or it's not touching them or telling them exactly to, to do anything. It's just to tell somebody, get comfortable over there. And I always, that always struck me as one of the most brilliant ways to get people to pose because everybody knows how to find a level of comfort. And so I've never forgotten what David taught me. And so I just, kind of put people in a position that I want and then I tell them to get comfortable and then I might direct their hands up and down or move them slightly if they're inside on a wind against a window to just make sure I can see them that the glare hasn't gotten too much in their faces and sometimes the glare works as a really interesting um, way to kind of like not see through it's bizarre it's there's a black and white photo coming up that I'll talk about how that actually I think works in its to its favor what about what about masks or uh, have you found people donning masks or for the most part? No, nope. no, not w not one. Sorry, I just uh, responding to a comment here. So, OK, so sure. let's uh, let's look at a few more pictures, Paul. Actually, this picture. So when Paul was asking me about what I thought about this project kind of before he really went live with it he sent me this picture in a text and i looked at this thing and i was just stunned by it this was the picture that i i, I was like paul was like you think i should do this and i was like i saw this picture i was like absolutely absolutely this is a story that has to be told because i looked at this and i almost got chills and um for me this was the picture this this was the picture that really made it now i know you've built a lot more content since then but but you know, it's great. It's fortunate that you made this image right off the bat because uh, I saw this and I knew that this was a, a great idea. Yeah, that's my niece and my nephew-in-law and their two kids. And it, that to me was like, I knew it, it's the great photojournalist Sam Abel said, you know, after a while when you're in the presence of a photograph and that's exactly what I felt when I was seeing this. I was like, oh my goodness what is happening right there i you know i just had them stand there but then it just came together i mean as so storytelling as storytelling pictures go for me uh this is it and when i saw this i i knew this was a worthy project but also i mean not only just the sort of haunting feel of the people kind of crowded together in the doorway but just the the geometry and the composition and just the shapes and the squares and and the red offset by the brick, the horizontal lines and the vertical lines and the triangles and the inverted triangles. It's just, just really a beautiful and you, image. And you're forgetting one last thing, which is for me, 
all of those things that both of you have just discussed. But for me, the devil is always in the details, and it's that amber porch light. Every time I see this photograph, it's the it's that porch light, which this, I don't know, maybe it signals to me something that I'm, um, I'm uh, projecting in this day of coronavirus, but it's just sort of this little glimmer of hope. I don't know why, maybe I'm reading into it too much, but that porch light finishes the picture. It's just Actually, a beautiful I, image. I think you're really right. I, and I, I felt that way about it as well. And it is kind of like, um, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. So it does have, it is like that little, there, there's that little sort of rectangle of despair going on with the little beacon of hope just, just right outside. So really beautiful image. Right. So, Paul, do you, do you, if you want to talk over these, let me know, or I can just yeah. sort of uh, keep scrolling I'm, through them, or if you want me to stop the, at any point. One of the things is um, I'm looking for pic pictures within pictures, frames within frames, and a lot of it, because of the nature of the long lens, really helps because you have a very flat perspective, and it really helps clean things up in a way, you know, like in terms of photographically speaking. But um, it's just as it's one of the – one of the things you learn as a photojournalist is to make every part of that photograph mean something and be useful. And I just, I just love that the, the way the architecture has shown up, not only in this photo, but in all of the photos that I'm finding and things that surprise me. It's just amazing that the little details that you find on people's front porches and the beauty that the architects and the designers used in creating their homes. And then when you put it in the context of these people and what they're facing, it makes it even more profound, I think, in, in a kind of a subtly beautiful way. So these are the Laufenbergs and they're our friends and they live in this beautiful old turn of the century, the uh, old house, an old farmhouse that they've renovated. And they were this, I wanted to have one other Set session and so I asked them if they wouldn't mind and they allowed me to come by and photograph them and it just so happened that it was St. Patrick's Day the weekend before and they still had their flag on there and that is what made it extra special for me was that flag yeah. I mean I also like the little yeah, it, uh, little rainbow uh, in the window yeah yeah it's all no that easy. flag is the flag is key because it, again, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, when people are looking at these pictures in our time capsule, sorry to keep coming back to that, that image, but, you know, people forget it was the St. Patrick's Day that didn't happen this year. Um, right. You know, there's so many things that, you know, people will remember about that and they'll go, oh yeah, it was St. Patrick's Day week, just the way they'll remember something when the Titanic went down, they remember, oh, it was a... I, I saw that flag too, and I said it just perfectly places it into a, a calendar now, and people will remember. Oh, it was the spring. It was St. Patrick's Day. It was still cold. All of those right. little details. Right. Little Charlie. I'm trying to photograph the family as well, so that they'll have individuals of the kids as much as possible, and then the couple. Uh, the, 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 the you spouse. know what I love about these is that you know the, the kids aren't dressed up. You know, it's not the uh, everybody in jeans and and white Oxford shirts. You know, it's it's the kids in sweats and flip flops, and that's just kind of how they're living their life right now. I, I'm telling you, I just feel like this has removed the artifice from portrait photography for me, in both from a technical standpoint and the content of the way people are. It's like people. I think realize that how they are is just fine and just perfect. It may be a Midwestern thing too. They're not, you know, people are, seem to be very comfortable in their skin, but I just love that they're real moments. They're not documentary photos, but they're in a, in a way kind of documentary portraits because they're not like necessarily meant to be on a Christmas card, but there's something real about them, and I mean, it, it helps that this is one of my son's best friends, too. Oh, sure. I, it, it's going to have even more impact as time goes on. 
but this one just they were just standing the parents were standing off to the side and as i was photographing the kids and i saw them in that little open space and i thought oh my gosh that's a gift you know right there and then that the trees are still without leaves sets the time and then of course our favorite saint patty's flag and i love that it's saint patrick's flag and not the american flag which i use in some photos coming up but in this case that made it was just the the tone and the colors oh i could i could when i when i'm shooting this i'm thinking oh my gosh that is just too much it's just like a gift you know yeah and you have that nice flat wisconsin light yeah it was perfect and you have you have by the way go back one sec greg you have two you know each picture has one little detail which is you know the the, the joy of the little girl and a little bit of trepidation on the boy, you know? I don't know, that makes the picture for me. Um, you know, he doesn't have quite the, the happy face and I think that kind of gives it the feel that's appropriate for what, what you're doing here, which is a little bit uneasy. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned that nice flat Wisconsin light and now here's a nice, beautifully backlit image. Well, I was thinking of my friend, Matt Mendelson, the master of the backlit portrait. <laughs> and <True. laughs> I yes trademark back trade the sick the Matt Mendelssohn signature photo but I, yeah. I I photographed these the folks on the front of their house and then I thought well it was kind of harsh a little bit and I thought not not like really really harsh it would pop in and out but I thought I want to try one where I know that it's a uh, gonna look good for them so I photographed them on the porch as well out on the front sidewalk a little bit closer to me and I was up on a ladder to kind of give that a little bit of clean up the perspective a little bit but then I thought I want to shoot that down the street shot too because I thought it would it would be something that would one look really great it's it's one of those kind of situations you can always I think get a great photo in that with the light you're not fighting it and it looks just beautiful and it's just some reflection does, from the sidewalk. And it's not, you know, it's not immaculately, exquisitely posed down to the nth degree. You know, there's personality that comes through. And I just love the little kid on the on the right side of the image. Just, <laughs> I don't know what he's doing, pulling his shirt tail down. Or well, his uh, shoulders what, what, made it, what made it for me was the dog barking at me. That's why I picked that <laughs> photo. Because there's other ones where he's not. But, oh, the Clement oh, family. Wow. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah, this is really, really good with their 10 day old baby. Can you imagine yeah. facing wow. this with three little ones like that, a three two, three year old twins and a 10 day old baby. And yet they did it with such grace and such, such beauty. And, and the girls originally came out with no uh, coats on or no sweaters. And I said, well, if you guys want to go get a blanket or something to warm up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, that just made it. I mean, yeah, just made exactly. the photos. Yeah, that's another Fantastic. image. Just makes my hairs on my arms stand a little bit. Ah, and that's wow. Same, I hadn't seen this girls. one. This is the first time I'm seeing this one. This is just really oh, beautiful, Paul. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I just... The... Yeah, that just... it. I'm, I'm taking these photos and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is just unbelievable. Here's another one I think that's just... Uh, you know, just such a storytelling image. And I know it's the lead page on your uh, website and certainly what we use to, to tease out this uh, live stream. But again, this is just a really geometry and the power in this image is just, you know, it's just incredible. Just amazing little girls. And, you know, they will now have, uh, I don't know, they're th not sure if they'll have a memory of this. I mean, I remember when I was three, one of the first things I remembered was a big news event at that time. But I don't know if they'll remember it, but I, I it might. It might resonate for them, and they might hold on to it. But now they will have something to look back on and be reminded of. This is my son's uh, principal at his elementary school. And it's it's so fun to go to these and and say, oh, 
you're Sparky's principal, and it's it's great. The the one just before that, Greg, was the one. The black and white was the principal. Oh, this one. Uh, yeah. Okay. And let and I and, and I know it sounds like when we're talking about this, these are all Paul's friends. But what you have to understand about where Paul lives is he lives in a really small town of five thousand people. So it's one of those places where pretty much everybody knows everybody, especially if you have kids in school. And so. Right. Um, so yeah, it's one of those communities where you know everybody is pretty friendly. So everybody's friends with everybody. Yeah, I think and that's the key. To the project. That's the key to the project. It's it's not strangers. This is our town. This is your town, right. and it could be people you know. I mean, that's that's essential. I th and I agree with you. I, I think it makes that connection complete. You know, when there is a little bit of that familiar uh, familiarity there. Um, between the people that you're photographing and the people with the camera, or the person with the camera. And this couple, uh, their, their, their son played baseball with my son and the mom is a police officer and her husband's in the army. And so they're impacted by this. And yet their kids seem to have a really great sense of, uh, you know, they seem to be handling it really well even though it's a very, very tough time for mom because she's, you know, first responder and spending a lot of time working. Okay. Oh, that's a beautiful picture. These guys were great and, uh, I love their willingness to to give a smile with the photo because you know sometimes I don't want them to all be kind of dour Gloomy. or sad and I yeah because I think there's there's an amazing community around this town and there's amazing community through this project and it's like these folks I had never met them before but she sent me a note and she said we're going to have to get together as families after this and I and I'm like. You bet. It's it's really so reaffirming to do this. These guys, like that door, blew my mind at how great it was. Yeah. And the little yeah. and the little guy with his matching top, and he was so cute because his name is Lincoln, and he was trying to give a little smile, you know, that they do at that age, and. And we were trying to work him through it. So it's like, just relax, just relax. And then Eloise, his sister, is just a playful, beautiful thing. And they were so, so cool. <laughs> so much fun. And I mean, it's hard to believe you get this in 10 minutes. But that's what happens, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lincoln. This was that photo I was thinking about when I was talking about the reflections don't help you, but sometimes they do because they create mystery. And I mean, everybody's kind of partially obscured, but I actually really like it. It's, it was my favorite one of the reflection shots of their family. It reminds you of a type 55 gone awry. It's bizarre in, in a good way in terms of the look, it's really wild. I finally figured out how to get my Facebook comments in here. <laughs> so I thought that was I think, nice. I think this is one of the strongest pictures, Paul. But I, I agree. You just have enough of I and I and I. I mean, it's really, it's it's really really striking. Thank you. So oh, a little comment guest. from Mrs. Jarreau. Oh. Sometimes and, I guess you really you just, uh, I mean, I guess you have so many of these sessions booked. Sometimes I guess you just have to deal with, with the light that you have when you get there. And so this is, you know, and, probably not the most flattering is, light, but it is what it is, right? But I like the drama of it. I like the fact that it's hard light and it's, this is a hard situation. And it's, it, you know, it's creating, uh, it's kind of like dramatic tension from the shadows. It's not beauty light at all. But I think it's further added to by her expression, but also the black and white, because there's other ones of these 
the couple and they're um, uh, smiling and smiling and it works fine, I think beautifully too. But I, I really like this one. They're both young, newly married and teachers and they're just, just such a sweet, sweet couple. Another, yeah, you're really lucking out with these houses in, uh, oh. in Lake Mills with the geometry that you're running into here. Right. That's the same couple with just a slightly wider view to kind of show the geography and, or the, I mean, sorry, the geometry of it. And I, I actually like the fact that the light is harsh. If, if this situation would have been different, I might have taken a, a flash out and lit it but you know in a lot of ways i'm just like no i like the fact that i'm having to work with the tools that I'm, I'm given in this situation whether it's front light or side light or backlight reflections or no reflections or utilizing the geometry and the architecture of the place to create frames yeah beautiful beautiful composition i like that you got a, that that blue sky in there just a, a oh. photography 101 tip for uh, some of the folks out there. There's usually, in bright sunlight, there's a natural band of polarization that exists in the sky. And, and what you get in that natural band of polarization is you get that really deep blue. And so how you find that is it's, it's always at a 45-degree angle or a 90-degree angle, I'm sorry, a 90-degree angle to the sun. So if you just point your um, index finger at the sun and hold your thumb at a 90 degree angle, you'll, you can figure out where that natural band of polarization is. When I went out to their home, I was just blown away by all the blue and how it just like repeated itself through the photo, the blue and the brown. And I love it. But I think what makes this photo is the Easter eggs on the bush. I mean, that just was like, oh, gosh, it was just such a gift. And they were so lovely. Right. And oh, that is so subtle. You know, I had not even really noticed the Easter eggs on the on the bush with no leaves on it until you pointed that out. Yeah. It, is, it is so subtle. It's like the St. Patrick's yeah. Day flag. It just places it onto the calendar for future generations. Right. Exactly. And I love that it's still that dried brown pre-spring grass and the fields have not been plowed yet and it feels like a a spring uh sky to me growing up in wisconsin that feels like march to me that really feels like march and in the past i probably would have put a light on there to fill the shadow and you know what i just didn't and i well i didn't have one with me for one thing but the other thing, it's just like, no, I'm going to just go with this and use it. Mm -hmm. And I just, it, to me, it really I almost works. wonder if you could hit them with like a, like a silver reflector from a distance. But yeah, I, I, I think get you that could. you're trying to not add those, those elements that aren't there. I, it's you're trying to keep it, yeah. keep it, keep the images genuine. Well, it, it, I just feel like that would have been like a true portrait photographer approach. And that would have been me four weeks ago, three weeks ago. But this one has a, this project has a very photojournalistic feel. And I just want to keep it really true to my roots. And gosh, it's just so amazing to come back to that. So let me just say, uh, any, anybody out there that's watching on Facebook or YouTube, please uh, send your comments and your questions. I, I am finally able to see them now. And as you can see, I can get them. Uh, up on the screen so that Paul and Matt can see them. So go ahead and send those questions and comments. I love those talks. <laughs> oh, classic Wisconsin. Oh, see, there's. Gotta have the corn <laughs> silos. The only thing you're missing in this image is a cheese head. Yeah. I know he's got a Brewers jersey too. We're not in Washington D.C. True, that's true. If you go back to that one of the boy with the Brewers, they they were they're such Brewer fans, and they were just crushed because spring training is going on, and they went out there for their their spring break and just wanted to warm up in Arizona, and 
just the first game, the, the opening season game, they got rained out. And the next day they canceled them. So it was just like they were so crushed that not only did spring training go away, but now it's like who knows when and if there's even going to be a season this year. Uh, exactly. And now the Olympics are postponed for another They're year. They're postponed. Yeah. So it's going to be really interesting times. I mean, even just, uh, you know, in terms of the political process in the United States, we're probably not going to have any political conventions. So how is the election process even going to get resolved? There's just so many questions. And the, this is my daughter's uh, friends and they're friends of ours. And they're just a lovely family. And I just think not only are they all stunningly gorgeous but they're also incredibly nice and they they have such a strong um positive way about kind of weathering this crisis that we're going through and and i love this photo of of, of trey and jess and i almost sense a little bit of fear in Jess with her, the way she's holding him, but I, I, they just have such a wonderful, strong bond. And I just love the feel of this. I can't even imagine facing this with, uh, with a, a little one like that. Cause I just, cause having to worry about just the issues of toddlers now i've got a 10 year old and a 14 year old and my kids are like my son's on Fortnite, my daughter's on instagram and TikTok. so you know they're basically taking care of themselves until school starts and you know we're trying to do things too with them like to get them out and playing basketball riding their bikes you know still doing the social distancing stuff which is very difficult for them because they're so used to being with their friends all the time I mean, all the time. Our house is like a, a Greyhound bus station. It's just crazy, f full of kids usually. But uh, I love the, go, the, the... Go back, Greg. I mean, again, not to, to beat a dead horse here, but every picture, every great picture has a little detail to it. And of course, this one's not so little, but just that welcome sign, um, yeah. you know, Wisconsin, uh, you know, but it just feels so purely Americana in a time oh, of utter fear and, you know, terror. And here you have just this beautiful welcome sign. It's the, the they all work within the context, the greater context of the, the, the nightmare that's going on here. They work against it. And there's, there, you like, know, there's a, a grittiness uh, to some of the images and, and you know, a, a genuineness and a realness to them that you know you don't see in a lot of uh, typical family portraiture. I've always felt like photojournalists see weddings differently and see portraits differently because we we know that moments really happen, and when their real moments happen, they're so beautiful that we can't even envision them. Sometimes, I mean, I remember when seeing things happen at wedding said, Oh my gosh, I just saw that. Or even when it was a news event. And I think it's the same within a portrait. It's set up within a certain area. There's parameters, but then people just, if you allow them to be themselves and let them know it's okay to be themselves, they just give you the most amazing photo gifts. I think. There's some more of that Matt Mendelson backlight. I know. And I just love the fact that they're all together. And uh, this yeah, one. This, this is the cover of a book, right? Yes. This, absolutely. this one I, I made it this morning. And the mom is in the, she's a medical, she's a healthcare worker. And she came out and came out on the front porch. And it's a beautiful old Victorian. And she goes, well, we're not really, we don't really spend any time on the porch. It's kind of like a three season porch. It's not closed in or heated. And, and then the steps, she said, we really go in the back. And I go, oh, okay, well, that's fine. So I went and checked the back out and came back and said, yeah, let's, let's photograph in the back. And as I was coming in with my ladder, I saw the stickers or the construction paper hearts on the window. And I said, 
oh my gosh, I have got to make a photograph of the three kids in the space with that because that just, oh my gosh, it knocked me over when I saw it. And then that they were just such strikingly beautiful children. I, I mean, it, it's just like, I'm shooting, I'm making the photograph. And again, it's like the, the two little twins in the window. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is just unbelievable. Well, Larry this Downing looks- and Wally and Dirk and Diana Walker, they would all be proud of you because you definitely have that mag magazine composition here which you left a nice little uh, place for the masthead up at the uh, at the top of the image <laughs> yeah. here so this is definitely your book cover right here i think it's your yeah. book cover too i mean it really yeah. to me it that the little girl on the right i mean it looks oh. like a picture that could have come out of belfast 1980 during the troubles i mean it's just yeah. what a face on that kid those eyes oh, and the, the rosy cheeks that's your that's your cover picture right there yeah Anything i think so and that, that's your title of your book, Thinking of You All. I mean, it's it's just everything oh, in that. <laughs> I was, I, I'm just walking into the car and I'm thinking, my gosh, what did I just see? It was just like, it was a gift from God. It is. This is, this is the picture. Hmm. Thinking of You All. <laughs> I, you, you, owe me, you owe me $5 when your book comes out called <laughs> Thinking of You All. Yeah, and okay. novice producer there. I probably should have put the uh, the cheese tweet on that image. But I know that Nikki was sending the cheese tweet to go with the image while ago with the cornfield and the and the corn silos. Oh. It was that classic Wisconsin oh. image that I I said looked like um, all it was missing was yeah. the uh, was the cheese, the cheese head. head. Yeah, so right. she sent a she sent a uh, she made a Facebook comment <laughs> with a cheese with a slice of cheese in it, and I I. Yeah. I probably should. This was probably not the image to put it over. So the rookie, the newbie uh, producer here will oh. uh, take take that fall on that one. Yeah. No, this is just beautiful. So here we are, back at the beginning. Back to the top. Yeah. So. Hey, Greg, can you come down to show you something here? <laughs> That's my sister. So Paul is. Paul, as I look at these pictures, another mutual friend of all of ours, Dina Douglas, and Cal are the great wedding photographers in the world. And yesterday, Dina posted this photo. Now I'm holding up a phone, um, so I know it's not going to be very. Let me see if I can do that here. Can you see that? That's, yeah, that's pretty. That's good. Dina's grand. That's Dina's grandmother in 1918 during the flu epidemic. They all have oh. masks on. Including, oh including the, the dog here. Can you see here? Oh Oops, my let me gosh. go the other way. Oh, oh I see. Go the other way. Yep. Here we go. Here we go. Here we now go. You lost your backlight. Get your backlight back on your screen. Yeah. Yeah. There, we go. there it is. Yeah. So the wow. dog has a map. You oh can't my gosh. see it at home, but you know, that's the record of Dina's grandmother. That I mean, every one of them has a mask on. And I think what you're doing is essentially the same thing. And in, the, you know, a hundred from now, just like this, people will look at these photos. I'm going to show you one other photo, which again, on my iPhone, you're not going to be able to see very well. But that, let me see if I can get it. Oh, yeah, yeah. There it is. There you go. Oh, yeah. So that's my great, that's my great uncle Joe Mendelson in 1916 on his motorcycle. And he would be dead two years later in the same flu. Um, so I think these portraits... As, as Rachel LaCour tells us with Save Family Post, these are pictures that will, will certainly stand the test of time. Absolutely. So um, let's just see. Let's open it up to questions here on, um, on Facebook and YouTube. We'll give everybody a minute to get some uh, some questions or some comments in. I, you know, again, we kind of put this together. I, it was kind of late getting the uh, information out about uh, that we were going to do this live stream tonight. So, wish we had been able to build up a bit bigger of an audience. But uh, rest assured that this video will live on Facebook and YouTube for a long time. And so, please, please share the um, the links. <clears throat> 
uh, far and wide on social media so we can get uh, make people aware of this this project and and others like it it's not hard to tell that Nikki is a photographer's wife Paul <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let me just, uh, that's, that's beautiful work, Paul, and, um, and really, I think, uh, I think important work. And, you know, like we talked about, I think uh, this is a truly unique time in history, and really, who is going to be the, the Matthew Brady's and the Dorothy Langs and the Robert Kappa's and the uh, Larry Burroughs and the Nick Utz, who's going to, who's going to step out and sort of be the storyteller, uh, for this crisis in our lives here. And, um, I think it's a worthy project and I, 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 I think that any criticism of it is, is unfounded. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sit here and say, I want, you know, everybody to grab their cameras and, and run out and start doing some kind of project like this. But, I do think, you know, there needs to be a, a documentary of what's happening right now in the world. And um, I have an idea about doing another one of these live streams. And I'm, what I'm working on is I'm trying to get a bunch of photographers from around the world to come on and maybe talk about kind of how they've been affected. Uh, I have, I've spoken to some folks from Tokyo, Hong Kong, Australia, uh, London. I'd really like to find somebody in Italy. So if anybody can recommend somebody to me in Italy that would be willing to come on, uh, I would love to hear um, all those perspectives. And I, I, I want to just twist Paul's arm a little bit here about something that I've talked to him about. And I, and I know he knows what I'm going to say. Um, there really needs to be a, uh, a global record of this. And so I've talked to Paul about maybe starting some kind of an Instagram feed where, uh, with a hashtag where people could submit to an Instagram feed and maybe we could start some kind of, uh, some kind of daily posts for, of images around the world of how people are being affected in different ways. And I'm not, I'm not encouraging anybody to run out and, and go into groups or put themselves at risk. And more than anything else, I'm certainly not encouraging anybody to go and put anyone else at risk. And, and you know, as we all know, that is the biggest thing. Maybe some of us are less uh, compromised uh, in this situation than others are. But we have to re remember that even if we are not compromised, we can still carry the disease. Uh, we can still carry the virus and we can still give it to others who may be compromised. So really, we need to any, anybody that's going to try to participate in something like this really needs to to listen to what the medical experts in their area are saying and, you know, and follow those guidelines. But I do think it would be a fascinating uh, collection of images from around the world that I really could see uh, in a Smithsonian gallery, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of, Museum of Art. I could really see this being a big deal and uh, having a massive impact uh, long term. So uh, I agree. Any of you guys have anything you wanna you wanna add before we wrap this up? Hmm. I'll just I'll just reiterate what I said at the top of the broadcast. The broadcast. <laughs> um, I feel like we're on Nightline here. Um, I, I think it's I think I agree with Greg. It's an open source project that is that is limitless. I think, uh, and I agree further with Greg that you know the rule of thumb here is if you're watching this and you're not Paul Giroux or you're not a professional photojournalist with 30 years, 35 years, take pictures of your kids and try and replicate this inside the house. Let Paul do the pictures outside the house uh, and, and, and take on the risk. Um, anybody else should just uh, limit it to trying to photograph what's going on in like a visual journal uh, inside their house. So, um, but I agree, I think it's limitless open source. You can, you can hook up with photographers in, in Paris and, and in, in Tokyo doing the same kind of thing. I think it's a fantastic project, and I really congratulate you, Paul, for thinking of it. And I think, uh, as Vivian and, and Matt just said, this can be done in your own home. I mean, you can document you know, how your family's uh, 
living your own lives, and certainly you can get more uh, of that more intimate, those more intimate situations that are you know behind the the glass doors and behind the porch, and really uh, what's going on inside your home and inside your family. Right, drinking hot chocolate in bed. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let Paul do I'm the outside stuff. I, I'm afraid if I did all the photos of my kids, it, it'd be the most boring photos of my kid with a headset playing. Uh, uh, his crazy game <laughs> that just totally escaped me, and then my daughter on her smartphone on her in, on, doing Instagram. It would be just photo after photo after photo of that. But if you were doing my daughter, it would be her on the couch watching Parks and Rec and The Office nonstop for eight non-stop. hours every day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and Kate is catching up on on um, uh, Grey's Anatomy too. So she's, she's going through the whole series. I think that's about 11 or 12 seasons. Crazy. So, oh so uh, I do want to just uh, give Matt a little shout out here because Matt has been so kind to, to come on and help me out with all these things kind of on short notice quite often. But um, Paul kind of jokingly referred to Matt as the, master of backlight and i just wanted you guys to see a little bit of his uh oh yeah his work here and though these are certainly not uh corona portraits but beautiful images oh gosh just the master of that beautiful portrait backlight you can go to families instead. <laughs> yeah. Families. Yeah, it's under portraits, under portraits. There you oh, go. Who's that, that little one? Down. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful, Matt. Just beautiful. Thank you, Malik. It really is. Shout out. Shout out over. You don't need to do any more, but thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to wrap this up. So, um, as I mentioned, I want to just uh, put these links back up. These are some uh, links from uh, organizations for photographers with uh, with COVID-19 resources. Uh, NPPA, the National Press Photographers Association, I think has really taken the lead on this. They have some great information uh, out there. They are going to have a, um, a town hall meeting tomorrow night uh, at 8 o'clock on a live stream. I think it's well worth everybody's time to uh, to take a look at that. So I hope you guys will join in on that. I don't think that I am going to be trying to do a live stream tomorrow night because I think I'm going to try to watch this myself. But um, uh, let's see here. Uh, this is the ASMP website, which is the uh, – uh, is this the American Society for Media Photographers, I believe? So you can see that they also are having a series of town hall meetings. So they're going to have one Friday night, March 27th. Um, they're going to have their director, Tom Kennedy, on with, uh, with their uh, legal expert, Tom Madry, um, as well. Uh, on the NPPA uh, live stream that they're going to have tomorrow night, they're going to have their, uh, their safety officer, Chris Post, who, God bless him, I've been trying to get Chris on to do a, uh, a live stream here. And uh, he is just overwhelmed. He is a working uh, photojournalist for a television station in Pennsylvania, and and he is being run all over um, creation, um, working on these COVID, COVID stories. And so he's doing that and trying to uh, support all of the MPPA members with good safety information. He's also an EMT, so just really God bless this guy, that guy, and he is um, really burning the candles at both ends. And then lastly, I just want to bring up the PPA website here. Oh, let me find it. Sorry. So the PPA website has some information here. Uh, I think that is particularly useful. Now, I don't believe that you can get to this page for whatever reason from the main PPA site, uh, but they do have uh, this link here that um, I, th- I think is a, uh, a summary and a digest of sort of what's going on with the governmental response, what kind of uh, aid may or may not be available. So I think that'll be a good resource for everybody. 
And so with that, guys, I want to thank uh, Paul Giroux for coming on. Uh, Paul's a great friend, and I'm, I'm really proud of him for this project and just taking the bull by the horns here. Not, not only just going out and doing it, but also just making some images that I think are really going to stand the test of time that are just storytelling and impactful and uh, hopefully will inspire others to document things going on inside their own homes with their own families uh, so that there will be a historical record of this unprecedented time in our history. So thanks, Matt. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And um, again, this will be on Facebook and on YouTube. So please share these links and help us uh, get this information out. Thanks, Greg.